So my story was, is one way that pimps use to lure their victims. Another way children can be lured into trafficking is, are just, are runaways. You know, a lot of kids will run away because of difficulties at home and um, they're picked up within 48 to 72 hours by a pimp or someone working for a pimp. Another one is foster kids. Foster kids already feel a sense of rejection and um, possibly shame or, or not feeling accepted. And so, you know, this is a big one for traffickers because they can really um, pull on that vulnerability to exploit them. 60% of all kids that are being trafficked are, have a direct relation from, to, to foster care. Child trafficking was not a part of our organization, but because of what we um, have seen and what's coming to our door, we have just partnered with um, a, a, a trafficking organization that will provide training. And so that is an area that we are going to be really focusing on because we feel that if we could get to the 500 to 800 that do not have health insurance that are on the street, if we can get to the 4,680 foster care kids that are missing before the child traffickers get to those youth, if we can get to them first um, through our work, then we think that, like I said, tra child trafficking can actually stop, stop here. There's a large need for safe houses in the area, long-term and short-term facilities. Um, a lot of that is just funding. Um, we have some other nonprofits that we work with that are working toward getting safe homes open, restoration homes open, um, but they're just working on the funding. It's a lengthy process to get the homes ready, to get the people trained, to hire trauma counselors and all the different personnel that are needed to meet the needs of the trafficking victims. Survivors have a lot to overcome, and it, it's different for everyone. Some of them, you know, the physical abuse they've experienced, the emotional trauma. Uh, I know one lady uh, had children. Um, when she was able to break free from being trafficked, she had children that were still in the control of the trafficker, and it took time to get her children back. Um, so there's all kinds of needs they may have coming out. Often they, they leave with nothing but the clothes on their back. They don't have any belongings. Those are all controlled by the trafficker. So all those needs need to be met when they come out. We want to make sure that our treatment approaches are trauma sensitive. And so th simple things like having a consistent place um, where sessions are held or making sure that we um, defer to the individual and ask their preferences before we assign the course of treatment that they're going to um, experience. It's incredibly important that that individual feel recognized and partnered in, um, or partnered with rather, with regards to their care and not felt like the treatment is being imposed on them. Um, one of the things that's really remarkable that we've come to understand better over the last a few years is that trauma, again, leaves a significant imprint on an individual. And so if you have an experience where you have felt incredibly overwhelmed or incredibly vulnerable or incredibly mistreated, on some level, you may come to anticipate that that is also going to be replicated in other experiences that you have. And so we need to be mindful of that um, in providing trauma-informed care, that a person may present in a way as if they anticipate something negative may happen. We have a responsibility to ensure that we don't uh, you know, personalize that or take that on or, and also take pains to not recreate um, that experience. As the clinician, you kind of have to, uh, you have to house that hope until the, until the client is able to um, achieve it for him or herself. And, and sometimes that they're in, that's, that's really the crux of it, that when there's uh, traumatic events and, and really challenging situations, people are not feeling particularly hopeful, which makes it difficult to do the work. And so um, those of us who are doing the work with them, we have to house the hope until they can, and, and, until they can get it from us. We, and then we let them borrow it freely and say, hey, have as much hope as you need and let's just continue to do the work because you're worth it. We didn't want to be just part of something that was just doing meetings. I mean, I know that was my wife's biggest uh, drawback to maybe not wanting to do this, but our hearts had already been kind of broken and we determined that 
you know, working together, it would not just be meetings, it would be actual effort, but also then to bring resources to bear to help those who are being identified. Virginia Beach Justice Initiative does not have the ability to solve this problem by itself. It takes each and every one of us. It takes um, the person who gets behind the camera. It takes the person who's willing to go on the radio. It's the person who has administrative skill sets. It takes the Commonwealth attorney. It takes the public defender. It takes I mean, the judge on the bench being willing to identify and work with this. You know, it takes federal, it takes state. It takes local government. It takes, you know, the larger piece. And all of us trying to figure out how can we put together a comprehensive program so we can prevent it from happening in the first place. But then also, once somebody is it's happened to them. How do we rescue them and then get them into the services they need so that they can rebuild their lives and become you know, productive once again? I have an organization called Identifiable Me. And so I, I get to do talks about many different topics. One of my favorite ones to um, bring awareness on is the issue of human trafficking. Um, human trafficking is, it, it's, it's, it's hard because, you know, it's people who are being preyed upon because of their vulnerabilities, because they never learn who they are, you know, and traffickers look at this vulnerability and they exploit it. You know, if you don't know who you are, you'll play that part, which is what happens when, when boys and girls are trafficked. They're, they're taught how to play a part you know, for the buyer, how to make that money. That buyer's thinking it's all about them. Where the person's being trafficked is thinking, I have to play this part so I can bring this money to my pimp. And so what Identifiable Me does, it encourages people to be themselves and have the freedom to be themselves, you know, in, in every way. And sometimes you mess up and, and sometimes, you know, it, it doesn't look well as you're going through the process, but it's sometimes just kind of going into your past and, and taking care of some of those issues of not feeling, feeling accepted uh, or um, looking for affirmation on the outside instead of um, affirming who you are on the inside. If your child is asking you for attention and your child wants to be a part of your life, let them be a part of your life. Because it's gonna take one incident, and, and I'm not just gonna put human trafficking into it, it could be a car accident, it could be um, in the wrong place at the wrong time and something happens to them. When you lose that communication and when you lose the opportunity to be able to talk to your child is when it's gonna hurt you the most. So why not make it good now? Why not just take the time to say, Hey, how was your day? You know, what did you do at school today? Or be that nosy parent and say, let me see your phone. Who are you talking to on Facebook? And when your child shuts a computer down and says, you don't need to know who I'm talking to on Facebook, that's when the internet should go off. You know, let's talk. How was your day? What did you do today? You know, and if you can't do that, then you need to start thinking about what type of parent you really want to be. You know, because this is real. And when you make that phone call to the Newport News Police Department and say, my child is trafficked, you have to think about what did you do to prevent it? What, did you, what steps did you take to prevent this from happening to your child? I gave, I sometimes give people the generic answer as to why I do this, why I got involved, you know, with the laws and such. But you know what, really, what tweaked my heart, you, my daughter wrote that paper, but that didn't even still get it for me. It wasn't until I saw a documentary where a young woman, um, they were doing a reenactment of an actual situation, where a young woman was in a room that was, I don't know, eight by eight or some small dimension, where she had a bed, a place to go to the bathroom. I don't believe there were any lights, just the light that was hanging above the, her, you know, that one light in the room, and everything, her life happened in that room. And men were brought to her, you know, hours and hours a day that she had to give sexual favors to. And she didn't have any choice. She can leave that room. That was her world. And it wasn't something she chose. And what got me, and what gets me now, what keeps me going, is that could be my daughter. It could be your daughter. Somebody watching this program, it could be their daughter, their niece, their friend, their son, their nephew, somebody at their work. And that's what drives me, even when it's hard, even when people you know, don't want to hear and such. It keeps me going, keeps me pushing, because, and it makes me passionate, because I don't want my daughter to be abducted. I don't want her to be lured into a trafficker's um, devices, and I don't want anybody else's to be either.
I'm Tanya Street, and I'm a survivor, overcomer, victor of sex trafficking. It's not easy talking about my story and, and how I got into it, and I'm glad that I got out, but you know there are so many others that have not gotten out. There are so many others who, who bodies have been thrown out of, out of cars and, and the police find them in ditches because pimps have, have beat them up or, or buyers have, have murdered them. It happens all the time. Women, men, missing, and no one knows about it. It's important to talk about this topic because we are all human beings. It doesn't matter what color you are. It doesn't matter if you're a girl, if you're a boy, how much money you have or don't have. Trafficking can happen to anyone. So that's why I tell my story. That's why I make myself vulnerable to transparency so that you can see that I'm telling the truth because I wanna make sure that you see clearly the picture, that you get a visual of how this happens, why this happens, and that it happens.